Hello, and a very, very warm welcome to you wherever you are in the world. I'm Georgina Godwin, and I'm the literary editor at Monocle 24, and a frequent chair at international book festivals, including the Lahore Literary Festival. And I'm so, so sorry that I can't be there in person this year. However, doing it this way, we can reach a much wider audience and crucially reach out to writers all over the world. We're deeply, deeply privileged today to be joined for the first time by the Pulitzer Prize winning writer Jumpa Lahiri. I know that Lahore has been trying to get her for years and years and years. She won the coveted award in 2000 for Interpreter of Maladies, her debut story collection. She's also the author of The Namesake, Unaccustomed Earth and The Lowland a finalist for both the Man Booker Prize and the National Book Award in Fiction, and the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships. Lahiri's, first, Lahiri's fifth book was a collection of essays she wrote in Italian while living in Rome, and she continues to write and publish in Italian and translate both her own work and the work of others from Italian to English. The process of writing in Italian and translating into English is something I'm particularly looking forward to hearing her discuss with her interlocutor, Razia Iqbal. Razia is one of the main presenters of two international flagship current affairs programmes on BBC News, NewsHour on the World Service and The World Tonight on Radio 4. She was the BBC Arts correspondent for 10 years and she's worked as a foreign and political correspondent. She's also a very dear friend. And I hand over to her now, Razia. Georgina, thank you so much. I'd also like to add my regret that we are not all meeting in person soon, I hope. In the meantime, welcome to you all from me in London and joining me from New York, Jumpa Lahiri. So good to be talking with you again, Jumpa. Lovely to speak to you as well. Uh, you honor me by this, uh, with this conversation. And um, just a small um, correction, I'm actually in Princeton, New Jersey, just so you know, uh, not okay. even in New York. <laughs> but joining close, us, joining close to New York. from the United yes. States. Um, yes. The last time we spoke, uh, Jumpa, was in London when your last novel, The Lowland, was published. And now your first novel since then, Whereabouts, is soon to be published. Let's start there. You've been writing in Italian and, in fact, have lived in Italy for some time. This is a novel written in Italian first by you and then translated by you in English. The first time you've done that, was that a good experience? It was a good experience. Um, I mean, I was a little, I, I wasn't sure how it would turn out, um, but that is the case with all new experiences, right? So there was a little bit of trepidation, but um, but the curiosity um, dominated in this case, you know. And so I did, I did set out to try. I thought, let, let me just see how it goes. And and in fact, it was an incredibly um, stimulating and, and and illuminating experience for me this time around to, to make the, you know, to travel back and forth between my own, these two iterations of my, myself and my, my own sort of um, writerly voice, if you will. Um, and so, so it was very positive experience with this book. Having said that, and now that there are other, already a couple of other Italian books, um, done sort of and in the in the pipeline um as it were i'm not convinced that i want to do it again so it's this strange <laughs> thing where it might just I, it might i might keep fluctuating and changing it up because i think whereabouts was a particular book and written in a particular way and it it it, it I don't know, for whatever reasons, the stars aligned and I felt that I was the right person to do it at that time. 
Well, we'll talk, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, that whole process. But this book is the story of a, a single middle-aged woman whose life appears to be lived in a state of suspension, if you like. It's a quiet life uh, in an unnamed Italian city. And although when I was reading it, I knew it was a novel, it is written as a series of kind of short vignettes that could, in fact, be individual short stories. And I felt as though you were bringing together all that you've learned as a short story writer and a novelist in this new book. I was, and that's that's a great observation on your part. I mean, and the book grew out of, as, as most of my books really have, just kind of exploratory writing, right? Not really knowing, is this going to turn into anything? Is this ever going to uh, become a book? Um, it's very rare that I know that. In fact, I've never really known that, to be honest. Um, even when I write short stories, you know, with the intention of writing a short story, I never know if the story will, will, will come to a conclusion, whether that story will then become part of a book, a collection. Um, so I, I started whereabouts in, in that frame of mind of, uh, you know, just started sketching, really, sketching these episodes. And I think of them as episodes. And I think of the whole book now as a sort of mosaic that I put together um, in, a, in a later stage because I started accumulating these pieces you know, of life. And um, I wanted to observe a character in different, literally in different settings to, to try to understand who she might be. Um, and, and then I started to ask myself where she came from uh, and what put her where she is and how she is and where might she go. Um, so those basic questions sort of began to lend these fragments, if you will, um, a, a, a collective purpose. And then I started to arrange them. I mean, I didn't write the book in the order that, that one sees it now, right? Um, in fact, the very last chapter of the book um, is, was the first piece I wrote. The very end of the book was the, was the beginning of the book. Wow. And I had no idea. Really surprising. That yeah. really wonderful to know, actually. And it tells us quite a lot about your your process as a writer. And I, I want to focus on the themes in the book in just a moment. But but I wonder if I can take you back to the beginning of your love affair with Italy and with the Italian language. The beginning the very, very beginning or sort of when I actually started writing in Italian or I mean, well, it's a I long... That you, did, you did a PhD in Italian Renaissance, didn't you? I mean, I think that's part of the beginning or, or take us back to where you want to start. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the first, the well, we can start with the first time I started studying Italian, which was, um, actually, we can start with the first time I visited Italy. Let's start that there. Um, and that was when I was in graduate school and I was writing a dissertation. I was doing research. I was preparing the groundwork for research in Renaissance studies. Um, I was looking at architecture. I was looking at literature. I was looking as, at, as, at Italy as a setting. And I had never even been to Italy before, but I was looking at, it as, at Italy as a setting Really, I think because it, it, it sort of grew out of my reading of Shakespeare and his plays and sort of thinking about why he set those plays, the plays. I, I knew that Italy was a setting for Shakespeare, of course. Um, and, uh, and I think maybe because of my undergraduate work in Greek and Latin as well. I mean, there was always this sort of area of interest, shall we say, um, broadly speaking, Rome, both ancient and um, and then later iterations of Rome and Roman culture, the city of Rome, what it represented um, throughout history and what it represented to to those who were not um, who, who came from 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 elsewhere to Rome. I was very curious about that. Um, in any case, so so then I went to Florence, um, and this is something I describe, I recount in, in, uh, in other words, the first Italian uh, project, um, literary project, and, and I went and uh, I spent a week there um, with my sister over um, sort of the Christmas holiday time. 
And it was really the contact, the first encounter with, um, with an Italian setting. For me, personally, I was in an Italian setting. And ostensibly, I was there to sort of look at the architecture and think about um, more formal um, things, you know, pertaining to my proposed dissertation and so on and so forth. But I think something else happened on that trip. I think there was um, a chemical reaction uh, similar to meeting the person you know you're going to spend the rest of your life with, you know, and I just knew that um, I, well, I don't know, that sounds dramatic, but something happened and it, and it led me to, to where I am now. You know, I, I knew that something was going to change. I, I wasn't sure how it would play out, but, um, but something happened on that trip. And it, yeah, yeah. And it was, and it was really connected to um, how I felt uh, in, in that setting, how I felt hearing Italian spoken all around me and um and and simply the 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 desire to be part of the conversation and and to not only understand what people were saying but to, to but to really be part of that conversation and so when i think about that person uh that um that jumpa you know who went to florence in 1993 or 94 or whatever and could just barely pick out a couple of words because i had studied french and latin and then I think about who I am today. It's it's kind of, I mean, I I too am sort of stunned at um, at what has happened. By what I has think happened. what's what's most impressive for people who may not know that story that you've just told is your commitment to mastering the language. And you mentioned your essay collection, kind of autobiographical essay collection, in other words, which you wrote um, in. In English, and Anne Goldstein, you wrote in Italian, but Anne Goldstein translated them into English. And and in that, there are so many things that resonate um, for me in the context of this latest novel. You talk about your craving for Italian and not feeling at home in English, which is surprising to me, at least, because English, of course, is the language that you were educated in it's the it's the language that you wrote re learned how to read and write in so I, I I wonder if you'll share with us that sense of attachment to the language that you write about in that collection of essays well this is such a profound question you know and I keep thinking about it because there really isn't a an answer or a, or a resolution but I I mean I think what I what I was getting at and what I still believe is that I really have, I have no um, pure connection to any language, right? I'm always, I've always been somehow both inside and outside of language. And so if you begin with Bengali and English, the two languages of my, of my, you know, sort of childhood and upbringing and, and formation, um, I was both at home in them. And, and I felt sort of, cut off from them in, 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 in very basic ways. And I think with, with Bengali, I felt cut out of, because it was the language I spoke to with my parents, with my, the world, the very elaborate world of my parents, um, which spread across continents and, you know, took me to, um, it enabled me to participate in conversations, whether they were in the United States with their friends or whether we went back to the UK to visit their old friends there, or whether we went to Calcutta to be, you know, to stay with relatives and so forth. Um, it enabled me, enabled me to access that conversation, of course. Um, but, you know, the main thing was that it connected me to my mother and father. It, it enabled me to feel uh, loved for the first time, protected, to taken care of, um, very basic uh, things um, for, for a child, uh, which were all associated with the Bengali language, not with the English language, right? Um, and yet I felt outside of it in that, you know, I, I spoke it well, but not the way they did. I could read it a little bit, but not really. I could write my name in it, but not much more than that. I never studied it properly. I always sort of, you know, got by in it. Um, and, and meanwhile, in English, I had the opposite experience, right? Because I could, I, I learned it 
very, you know, I learned it. That was the language, as you say, of my education, my reading and writing. Everything comes out of that. And yet I didn't trust it in the beginning. It, as certainly as a child, I was very wary of it because um, for the simple fact that my I didn't speak that language with my, with my mother and father. So um, I had to learn how to, um, you know, I had to learn how to to liter literally to trust myself in the language. Um, I actually didn't, I was very quiet as a child. And I think part of it was because I was, I was hesitant to use this new, pick up this new instrument, this new English instrument and use it. And, um, and it always made me feel separate from my parents, far away from my parents, you know, emotionally, it made me feel that I was somehow um, apart from them. And and so I think these are the factors that went into that feeling of, of not, not having uh, a sort of airtight relationship, if you will, with, with the language, the way that they did, did have and, and, and do have with Bengali, for example. I mean, it is really the language of their infancy, their childhood, their upbringing, their education, at least up to a certain point. So it's, it's, so it's sort of a, a home base it's not the only language they speak, but it, you know, it, it has that central place that, that represents both, you know, the world of the home and one's infancy and, and, and so on and so forth and the, and the greater world. There, and I didn't have that. Right. That, it, it's so interesting to hear you talking about, um, about language in this way, the, the relationship that you have with other languages, not just I I Italian and Bengali does, it seems to me hearing you talk about it now mirror the relationship that you have with the idea of belonging generally, which is, of course, the theme of so much of your of your writing. And, and I, I wonder which you were thinking about first when you first started writing. You know, were you thinking about attachment to language and how that can either root you or uproot you or make you feel untethered in some way? Um, or, or, or did the, the the theme of belonging and, and writing about people attempting to, to fit in and make lives um, in other places from where they were they were first born. I mean, I wonder which came first or whether this all comes together in, in, in your mind. Well, again, this is just such an enormous question that I, I, I will continue, I will think about throughout my life um, because it keeps changing too, you know, the variables keep changing. But, but I think what I've come to understand uh, with, with maybe with some greater clarity now is that it's it's a contradictory impulse. I mean, it's both the desire to belong, to find belonging, to create belonging, and it's also the the wariness of what does it mean to belong? Uh, what does it mean to say this is my language, this is my city, this is my place? Um, and I think in our world today. Um, just the political ramifications of, of, of that kind of thinking, right? This is my homeland. Um, as someone who has never had that kind of, I, I've never had a, a, a fixed homeland, a fixed language, a fixed identity, right? A fixed sense of belonging. Um, I mean, on the one hand, I'm sort of proud of it at this point, you know, at this point in, at, at my age as an adult, as a parent, um, as a citizen of the world, I think, well, maybe I'm better off. Maybe I'm better off not being able to wave the flag of any place. Um, maybe it enables me to be curious about the flags of other places because I don't, I don't automatically reach for my own, you know, um, because I don't have it, because I don't have my own. Um, at the same time, I won't lie. I think the lack of that, that, whatever you want to call it, the place, the language, the culture, the, 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 um, the land, right? Um, that sense of a fixed point of origin that cannot be questioned, right? That cannot be modified or that, that doesn't have a footnote to it, right? So if someone says, well, you are from India, I can say, well, yes and no. And if someone says, well, you're from America, I can say, well, yes 
and no, you know, so there was always this yes and no in, in, in at play. And, um, but I think that, that, that has also caused, um, caused a lot of, um, you know, um, a sense of loss for me as well. I mean, I, I craved that. I saw other people who had it. Um, sometimes it seems like a nice thing. Sometimes it seemed attractive. Um, and I think really because I was, I was raised by two people who were so, you know, who lived outside of the place they called home, but, but remained so deeply connected to it. Um, you know, I, I observed that my whole life, just that the meaning, the significance of that, that piece of land, that, that corner of the city, that building, that, that, that place. Um, and so it's also, it's not possible for me to say, oh, it doesn't matter. We're all just global citizens. And, you know, you know, I mean, it doesn't really, it's nice on paper kind of thing. Um, like, you know, I love John Lennon as much as the next, I mean, I love John Lennon and I, I you know, just think of a song like Imagine and yes, wouldn't it be nice, but it's, it's not reality, right? And the reality is that we do come from these different places and we do, we are products of, of the people who raise us and the places we find ourselves in and, and the cultures and the languages that mark us, you know? Um, so I think that, my ongoing project as a writer has been to try to just keep asking this question of myself and of others, of my characters, and, and constantly sort of shifting the, the coordinates, you know, to, to see it in different ways, uh, to understand it in a different way, because I think it's, it's an ongoing question, right? I wonder, I mean, of course, and, and it's it's uh, manifest in, in all of your writing and, and in many ways for me personally, it's what draws me to your work because it resonates with me personally, but I also recognise the universality uh, of it for so many people. Um, but I also am thinking as I'm listening to you speak about this idea of belonging and, and rootedness, whether whether you could ever see yourself or whether when you were younger, you could ever have seen yourself as anything other than a writer. Because as a writer, of course, you're able to explore these things and many writers have. And I just wonder whether there was ever any question in your mind that that is what you would become. Oh, well, I didn't know this is what I would become at all. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I mean, I did become it eventually but I I really didn't know and I didn't kind I didn't I didn't dare really think about it um because I think to be a writer you have to know who you are right you have to know who you are um and I didn't I didn't and, and for mo most of my childhood my adolescence my young adulthood um that it, it was, it was all so, it felt so blurry, this issue of identity and where was I really speaking from? Because even though I'm not from a certain, any place, right, we can establish that uh, as, as so many people can, you know, have a similar experience. Um, but I think to, in order to write, at least this is my sense, um, one needs a center. You know, one needs a center of gravity in a, in a kind of existential sense. One needs to understand, okay, I am writing from this position. Um, and that took a long time for me to, it took me, a, you know, like a better part of 30 years to sort of get to that point. Um, and I think the writing of those first stories and in interpretive maladies were, were critical because though that was the first time that was the first time that I worked it out in, in on paper, in words and stories, sort of who, uh, who I was, not that they're autobiographical stories, but sort of just where was I coming from? What was I able to, you know, what, what from what point or vantage point could I look at the world, right? That was the key because up until then I felt that I was sort of floating, hovering, you know, who was I? Where was I from? Um, too many questions swirling around. So much confusion. Um, so, but interpretive maladies is the first thing, the first, you know, after I wrote that 
those stories and stepped back and thought, okay, I am a writer and I am this writer. I am the writer who's writing and narrating the world through this lens here. Um, and that was, that was how, that was when I first began to sort of be the person I am now, you know, in, 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 and, and sort of understanding that I'm a hybrid creature, that I come from these, these, you know, different, different strains are, are, are abraded together, uh, in, in me, um, and, and they, they made me and they have, you know, influenced me and formed me and so forth. Um, it, it yeah. sounds as though, I mean, I, I, I wonder when you look back at that first accolade that you received for the interpreter of maladies, you know, the Pulitzer Prize 21 years ago now, you are the same writer, but you're obviously different. And I wonder in your own mind, as you're talking about your development as a writer, that you feel yourself that there's been an obvious coming of age. I, I think so. I mean, I still feel like that same, that first writer, you know, because I, I think that with every book, I'm, you know, it, it's always a reinvention of oneself and also a, a going back and a deeper recognition of oneself, you know, um, and each of the books, each of the books in, in whatever language, um, and also the translation work I've been doing recently, it's all part of a piece, you know, it's all connected. Um, and, and each project, you know, begins to, um, to, to, to sort of leak into the other project and, 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 and there are echoes and correspondences and things like that. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's ongoing again, this whole idea of coming of age is, you know, it's, 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 it's ongoing. There is no fixed point. Let's 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 go back to uh, whereabouts because th this is a, a a novel that again feels very quiet. There's a tranquil surface to pretty much the entire uh, novel. Each vignette has a, a, a starting point, and and yet the life of this single middle aged woman belies a, a, a deeper unrest. Uh, and and kind of frayed, distant relationships with both her mother, her her dead father, and and I I I wonder if you'll just reflect for us a little on on that as an idea, the the fact that you do this time and again in lots of different ways, and every single time it's it's compelling in different ways that you are seriously noticing the life of an individual? <laughs> well, I try. I mean, I think, you know, we have to find, we have to put our finger on, on some body, a character to start exploring. And it's always a kind of, I mean, literally a kind of excavation that, that takes place in the process of writing and with this character, as I said, um, you know, I, uh, the way I got to know her was by putting in, her in these different settings because, um, so, so as I mentioned, the, so the last episode of the book is set on a train and that was the first, the first vision I had of her. I saw a woman on a train sitting alone, um, and, and sort of suddenly, um, a group of people come on to the train, board the train and they sort of pass like a like a storm of 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 merriment and life and vitality um and then they sort of come on and then they get off again and and she sits to witness this arc of of life right as it were life collective life um and i wrote that scene out and then i thought who is this woman um why why did she think about the thing she how why did she reflect on this episode as she did and where might she be going where is she coming from and and but I liked the idea I think the, the key was that she was in movement um that she was suspended between places li literally you know kind of um on a voyage and and so I, I really wanted to start to put her I wanted to to move her around 
right? So literally put her in different situations. Um, and I also wanted to sort of understand the movement of her life, right? Um, sort of where is she on her journey? Um, what is she taking stock of it in this moment? And, you know, whether you want to think of, of the novel as a sort of, you know, Dantean look at sort of a person in middle age who sort of comes to a crossroads and wonders where, 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 how did I, where am I going and how did I get here? You know? Um, and, and so really the novel is very, um, it's a very basic story in that sense, right? It's a very basic story of a person in a certain, um, at a certain crossroads. Um, there is, the, there is there is there is so much in the novel that is also uh, it's a love letter to Italy on one level that there are dis even though the city is unnamed there are uh, constant uh, there's a recognition all the time of the kind of life that takes place in a, a neighborhood inside a, a city when you know some of the people you know the barista who serves you coffee or you bump into the same people uh, day after day. But there is also a, a longing at the heart of uh, the character's life and, and, a, and a remembrance. And, and it feels to me that these, these are the things that, as a reader, I immediately, I'm suffusing this in my mind and I take her away with me at the end of the novel. But I'm also acutely aware that your ability to create that the the one sentence after another of understated precision is hard won, um, I imagine, for you as a writer. And I, I, I think people would be interested to hear how much you are aware of your own sense of your style when you're writing and what it is that you are trying to convey in the tone that you're creating in this book. Well, I mean, this is the first sort of um, the first imaginative um, long form work I produce in, in, in my new language. Right. So um, and, and I think, you know, it was it was the, the challenge of this project was to use the Italian um, it, it, that I had already used to sort of express myself kind of a direct you know the, the 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 reflections, the essays, autobiographical essays um, that form in other words, uh, and to to take that um, to another level, and to um, that um, that that is formed of you know observations and. Uh, and other things, um, you know, yes, sort of glimpsed and absorbed from real life, but also, but, but, the, but, the, but the underpinning, the mechanism of the book is not, you know, it's not a simple matter of sort of remembering uh, and recounting and retelling things that happened to me. Um, so I really had to sort of enter into the state of mind of, of someone else in another language. Um, and but I think more, perhaps more to the to your question, you know, I think from the beginning, even in English, I'm I've, I've always I'm always striving to to say what I need to say with the least amount of fuss, in some sense, with the least amount of. I mean, I just I just try to do, you know, I, I do believe that that less is more. Though sometimes I don't, and I, sometimes I write in a different vein, and. Um, and there's a kind of more lyrical quality that come, can come out um, in a more elaborate syntax and things like that. So, um, but, but, but with this book, I, I just, I, I think more than the question of style, I was thinking of, I was just thinking of the voice and, and maintaining the voice of this character because it is a first person novel narrative, right? The episodes are recounted in the first person. So I really need to get inside of her literally to get inside of her to allow this voice to emerge and to be, to be to to feel consistent across the episodes that was that was key and the more i got to know her and her personality and how she would react to this and that that then it became you know with each episode 
um, obviously there was greater intimacy, right? I mean, I, I haven't obviously read the Italian, but I'm interested in the tension between the nonfiction that you wrote. In other words, when you didn't want to have that as a project that you translated from Italian into English, you felt that your English was, um, that you had mastered the English better and that somehow your Italian would be betrayed in some way um, if you did the translation of that. And I'm assuming that embarking on this imaginative project of writing the novel in Italian and then translating it yourself, that that you feel you are more at ease with whatever tension there is between your Italian and English now. I do. I feel I feel less worried about it. It's less of a newborn. You know, I, it goes to school on its own. I trust that it will come back. I trust that it will do its homework. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just a different, it's, it's I'm, a, I'm at a different level, uh, a different place um, on the trajectory, right? Uh, so I, I'm not as nervous. And I think the, the main thing, the main, the, the main fear I had, I mean, really the reason I can say now that I did not want to translate, in other words, was that it was just, um, I didn't have, I, I, you know, I, I didn't, believe that Italian had sedimented properly yet. You know, I still felt that the roots were just establishing themselves. Um, and I need, I instinctively, I felt that I needed more time to, to remain uh, sort of dedicated or loyal to, to, to my kind of main, maintaining a certain discipline in Italian. Um, and now I feel that that new part of me that I'm, I was trying to sort of graft onto who I already was, um, that that's taken hold more or less, and that it that it is now a part of me. That the Italian language is now a part of me. It's a relatively new part of me, but now it's been more like eight years of a constant, you know, activity and relationship with something with this new part of me, as opposed to three years, right? Um, and so the, the issue with, with, in other words, in 2015 and not wanting to translate it was really the idea of, you know, I'm, I'm climbing, 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 but the thought of trans, translating makes it, you know, makes me feel that I'm, I'm not climbing anymore, that I'm going back down the hill somehow. You know, that's how I ha had it in my head. And now, now I feel differently. Now I felt that the idea of, of going into English wasn't a going back right? It wasn't a going back. It didn't have those associations of going backward, of falling back, of regressing, of retreating, of going back to sort of a, you know, a center of gravity that would swallow up the new, the new terrain that I was trying to make strides in. Does that make sense? So that's what's really changed at this point. It, it does yeah. make it makes complete sense, and I, I I wish I had even a semblance of Italian in order to be able to read it in 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 the Italian as well. I I was looking this morning at um, Unaccustomed Earth, your second collection of short stories, and when I looked at the epigraph, which is from um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Custom House, where Hawthorne is it, it's it you know it's not Hawthorne the narrator is talking about human beings are like potato like potatoes can't flourish in worn out soil. My children have had other birthplaces and so far as their fortunes may be within my control, shall strike their roots into unaccustomed earth. The thing that struck me about that epigraph in the context of whereabouts, which which struck me like a lightning bolt today, was was about the idea how you can't. You can make a life, but you can't control it. And, and that felt to me like the essence of what Whereabouts is about, that, that it is the story of a woman who is just seeing what is happening to her. And, and the novelist is allowing us a glimpse into this life that you can't necessarily control, but you allow it to see where it goes and what happens with it. I was so struck by the con the connections in your work again and again, which are exciting for a reader because they they suggest not just a kind of dedication to an idea, but it, it seems to me a kind of a, a development of of the, the 
not necessarily just the same idea, but a series of ideas. And I, I wondered whether you were thinking about the the lack of control that a person has in their life when you were writing whereabouts. I think with age comes, you know, that bit of perspective in any case, I won't say, don't dare, dare say wisdom, but I, but clearly, I mean, I think, you know, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what tomorrow brings. We, we cannot predict um, how it's all going to play out. Uh, in spite of our plans, in spite of our best intentions, uh, our dreams, our desires, um, it's it's it's. Uh, and I think the older I get, yes, I, one 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 understands that um, you know it is it is a very mysterious business, this being alive uh, and moving through time, and you know I, I'm. I'm so pleased that you cited that epigraph, that those words by Hawthorne. I mean, even as I heard you reading them, and I remember first discovering them, and I just, they were so impactful. I think I must have just had to go to bed for a couple of days or something to, 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 to contemplate what he was saying and to realize, oh my God, here is Nathaniel Hawthorne, you know, sort of towering figure of American literature and he is reaching out from across the grave and talking to me. He is explaining me. He is describing me and my life and the life of so many people I grew up with. And in some sense, you know, he's my parents in that epigraph, right? I mean, I was thinking of my parents and their journey and their having to come to terms with what it means to move across the con across continents and establish a life in a new place and raise a family and so forth and now i i am the parent right now i have two you know uh, growing children i have an 18 year old and a 16 year old and it's a very different stage of life from when they're four and six and you pick out their clothes and tell them what to eat every day you know it's a totally different relationship and and one begins to 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 recognize and to uh, to appreciate um, the the that you can only do so much, you can only expect so much, um, and and in terms of the, this character and whereabouts, I mean, I think it, in terms of sort of the idea of un unaccustomed earth and rootedness and these metaphors, I mean, the interesting contradiction about her, to me at least, is that she's both floating, she's both suspended, clearly, sort of literally sort of drifting through from from setting to setting um but she's also so fiercely rooted to her place she's so incredibly sort of she she's she's i mean the, the really the, the, the real significant other in her life is is her city in some sense you know it's her it's her neighborhood as you say it's these relationships it's this it's this sort of um warmth uh human warmth that surrounds her and and and, and bolsters her um, and, 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 and she's apprehensive for that reason, uh, in terms of being anywhere else or, or, you know, going anywhere else or leaving that place. Um, so that sense of attachment, um, is, 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 um, you know, very much part of, of who she is in spite of the, the, the wavering and the oscillation and the, the, the lack of attachments, you know, I mean, I, I think, I think in this book, I'm really thinking about two of the big themes in my writing, in a, in a, but through a different lens. And one is, of course, place, which has been a theme from the very beginning, sort of the meaning of place, um, the meaning of a lack of a place, the absence of a place, so on and so forth. Um, and then um, the other is... Um, Oh my God, now it's completely slipped my mind what the other thing is. Um, anyway, certainly, certainly place. It'll come to me. I, I, I mean, I'm interested in um, the, the writers who inform the, the reflections that in your themes um, that you have uh, pursued throughout your, your writing career. This, the, this idea of behind closed doors, uh, dramas and and 
and the, and the writers that you have talked about who have influenced you or the writers that you read uh, most often are William Trevor and Chekhov and and those those writers who are who are willing to just reflect and every page that you turn you learn something that there's a story that starts with one thing and it just it has a twist and or perhaps it doesn't have a twist perhaps it's just leaves you with with a a sense of something and I, I I wonder who who else apart from those you you go back to time and time again not necessarily for inspiration but just to have informed the 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 base of your your life as a writer well, uh, I mean, I think it's there. There are definitely writers I, I continue to to turn to for guidance, or I turn to in different ways, right? Um, so someone like Joyce, who who you know, a writer who was so influential when I was beginning to sort of study literature and think about think deeply about literature. Um, now I turn to him in a whole other context because, of course, he too had this extraordinary Italian experience and moved to Italy and learned Italian and uh, was was quite invested in um, his life there and 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 his uh, so much of his linguistic experimentation I think um, is is influenced by his time in Italy and he wrote his major works you know um, when while living in Italy and in contact with um, Italian culture and literature, other writers and so forth. So he's someone I, I, re, I read and now I read differently. You know, uh, Dante is someone I read and now I read, I read differently. Um, I mean, I think that's great literature, right? Because it, it, it enables you to, to have, to form and reform relationships throughout your life, whether you're reading in college at, when you're 18 or you're, 35 and a young mother or you're 55 and no longer a young mother or, you know, whatever, wherever you find yourself, you know, certain works will, will constantly shed light. Um, so certain, so Joyce is someone I, I've been rethinking about. Um, and then of course there's been this whole kind of extraordinary deep dive into Italian literature. Um, and, and um, I, you edited, you, edited, you edited an anthology of Italian writers, yeah. I did. I edited an anthology um, called Italian, uh, the Penguin Book of Italian Short Stories. And I, I really looked at sort of the 20th century short story tradition in, in Italy. And that involved, I mean, that is the, the fruit of years of, 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 of reading and thinking about um, new authors in a new language, directly in a new language. Um, and, and being, uh, startled in the best of ways by how many correspondences there were, um, thematically and also linguistically, uh, between myself and, and many of these writers who were raised, um, across languages, who, who sort of spoke dialect at home and learned formal Italian in school, for example. So they always had this sort of, hovering relationship between the home language and the outside language. Writers who moved around, uh, who were born in Egypt, who were born out, you know, outside of, of Italy, um, who had this sort of um, inside-outside relationship with, say, their parents' culture, who, who had, um, you know, uh, this hybrid quality. And I think mm -hmm. the, whole, the whole, the sort of thematic underpinning of that whole anthology is this idea that, that Italy which on the surface, people may think, oh, it's this sort of, you know, this country, lovely country where everyone more or less speaks Italian. And, you know, it's not that international. It's not that. Um, and in fact, that's not the case. You know, there is no, um, that's not the reality at all. And I think the literature really, really brings that to the surface. If you read those stories, you see what an incredibly, you know, much like, um, you know, not to such a degree, but but and more analogous to the Indian subcontinent, right? More analogous to that kind of reality where you're living cheek by jowl with people who are, um, you know, your countrymen in some sense, and in the other and another completely different, you know, in terms of 
um, languages and, 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 and what have you. I mean, I think in certainly in India, the, 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 it's, it's to a greater degree, right? Um, even more complex degree. But that's what I was exposed to throughout my life, you know, is, 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 was, you know, going to a city like Calcutta and seeing the, the various groups and, pos- and p- populations and linguistic realities that were constantly in play in a city like that. Um, and realizing that even if I knew Bengali, well, I didn't, I actually, I didn't understand or speak Hindi. So I couldn't understand what the taxi driver was saying. And I couldn't, you know, understand what this, this uncle who came from another part of the country was, you know, so it was, and it was fascinating and, and invigorating and, 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 and so different from how I was raised in the United States. I mean, you know, um, and, and so I think that's one of the things that makes me feel quite at home in Italy because it pushes me back to, you know, another reality. And I think the reality for actually much of the world, <laughs> um, whether we're talking about, you know, Asia or Latin America or, or parts of Europe where this linguistic diversity exists, has existed, is just a part of reality right and the culture and 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 people um swim in that kind of sea every day you know i i i know that you will just dismiss uh the thing that people are saying about you in the context of this project that you've embarked on in you know with italian and your relationship with the country too that you are put in the bracket with Conrad and Samuel Beckett and Nabokov and and you've mentioned Joyce already and and I know that your humility will will make you just dismiss it out of hand but I I I wonder to what extent all of this is part of you asserting yourself as a as a as a writer you once said that you don't regard yourself as an assertive person and that yet writing stories is one of the most assertive things that a, a person can do. And, and I was so struck by that as an idea. I, just just talk, talk me through that, because you've also said that you write to feel alone. Well, I mean, in terms of the Italian, the desire to move into another language, I, I don't think it's... Um, I don't think it's to uh, assert myself, you know, a, 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 as a writer, but I, I think actually it's, and this is where all the writing has always come from. It's just, it's from a desire to really, to better understand what is on the inside. Who am I, right? Who, who is this person? Um, and the writing has always been the vehicle as it is for, I suppose, most writers to, to, to get to, to that ongoing point of understanding. Because I, I think, you know, the question begets the answer. I mean, when I said earlier, I was, I was very apprehensive about calling myself a writer because I didn't know who I was. Um, and that, you know, those first stories enabled, gave me a, a starter kit of sort of who I was. Um, but that question remains a question. It remains an open question because I do think that we are always becoming something else. We are both ourselves you know, and, and there's a sort of, there's a sort of thread that, that's linking all the different selves that we are, but I'm not the same person I was five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And, and yet I am right. And that's the truth. And I think, so the books are sort of these snapshots across time now of, of these, um, reflecting the basic, the basic truth of, of, of moving and shifting through, through time and space, you know, and, and, and I think in that sense, you know, I mean, the reason I'm writing in Italian is, is different from say, I mean, I think maybe more akin to, 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 to Beckett, you know, who leaves, who leaves Ireland, who has to get away, who, who establishes himself in, 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 in Paris. Um, and then who also did this interesting, you know, self-translation bringing his own work the French work back into English and I I mean I remember discovering Beckett when I was 18 uh, at university and and just thinking how could anybody do that you know I can I I, I'd be happy if I could write a a decent two-page story in English um 
how could anybody learn a new language and, or, you know, go move into another language? I was, um, I never imagined that, that, that would be, that I would one day embark on a sort of analogous, um, journey. I mean, I, but I think what's, what's interesting about what has been going on is that, you know, I didn't have to do any of this. Um, and maybe that's the, the, the freedom of it as well. Um, the fact that, well, I didn't have to, and I also had to, I mean, obviously I had to on a deeper level, I had to, because it's been so incredibly challenging and, and challenged me on, on all sorts of levels. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I think, I think, um, I think it's, it's certainly given me greater equilibrium, if that makes sense, in spite of the incredible, I would call it a happy complication of, of the state of affairs. <laughs> well, it certainly is a, a measure of your adventurous intellectual spirit. And um, I, for one, am hugely grateful that you've shared as much as you have with us today. And I know that everyone who is going to get the chance to see you speak about your your life and your development as a writer will appreciate what you have um, shared with us today. Thank you so much, Jumper Lahiri. It's a, a privilege. Thank you.